Welcome to Insight Education Group's webinar series, Virtual Education, Transforming Obstacles into Opportunities. Today we'll be discussing strategies and tools for principals to support the school community virtually. I'm Kia Johnson, project coach with Insight Education Group. And I'm Kim Day, also a project coach with Insight Education Group. And we're glad you're here to join us today. During our time together today, we ask that everyone participates actively, that you remain open to new ideas, and that you trust the process. The materials you need include the accompanying participant guide, and if you grab your phone and go to your camera setting, you can scan the QR code, which will give you access to all of today's session materials. Thank you, Kia. In terms of session objectives for today, we're going to be exploring strategies and tools for supporting the school community virtually, and during our time together, we'll self-assess and create actionable next steps for maintaining self-care, communication, instructional support, and sustaining morale and social emotional support. We acknowledge that people come to the table with different levels of expertise and different experiences, and we empathize with this situation that it's unique and will be a challenging learning experience for all. In terms of our time together today, we're gonna to be examining self-care, communication, instructional support, sustaining morale and social emotional support. And at the end of our time together today, we're going to ask you to reflect on your action steps and prioritize those things so that you can leave with very specific action steps. Thank you, Kim. So before we start, we want to ensure that we have a common language and understanding around distance learning. Take a moment to read the definition of distance learning to yourself. This is the working definition that we will use to define the virtual communities that we'll be supporting today. So before we jump in, there's a few things that we'd ask you to consider and to remember during our work. The first is that equity considerations are essential. And as we determine how we're going to support our school communities, it is going to be critical that we do so in an equitable manner. Second, during our webinar series today, we are going to be making some intentional connections to professional standards, because regardless of our situation, whether it's virtual or face-to-face, -face, we have a responsibility for providing instructional support. Absolutely. And in that same vein, it is going to be so important to remember that flexibility is crucial. This is new territory for everyone, and we have to remain flexible and open-minded. And certainly last but not least, this is not gonna be a one size fits all process. So we're gonna ask participants to honestly reflect on where you are. And as a result of those reflections, again, as we mentioned earlier, identify very specific action oriented next steps. We realize that this is a relatively short webinar and there won't be time necessarily to complete all of our action plans. But again, we hope that you'll find this time with us today valuable. So we're going to go ahead, Kia, and we're going to get started with self-care. And so in order to do that, I want to go ahead and make one connection to professional standards, which state that effective leaders develop the professional capacity and practice of school personnel to promote each student's academic success and well-being as well as their own. And Kim, I think self-care is the perfect way for us to start this conversation because it is so important. In a time when we tend to be focused on those that we support in our school communities, we have to remember that our own self-care is equally as important. We want to acknowledge that the stress and demands to perform right now are extensive. As a leader, your team is looking to you for direction. It is crucial to be transparent with your team about how you are taking care of yourself so that you can effectively take care of the entire school community. Your example invites others to prioritize and take care of themselves as well so that they can be as effective as possible for their students. For example, in a time when we are all easily accessible through technology, it is important to set boundaries. Your example invites others to do the same, and it's important that you communicate to your team that they should set boundaries for themselves as well. Um, it, along those same lines, Kia, being consistent 
and really thinking about how do we currently practice self-care and being honest with ourselves with respect to that question. We're going to encourage you today to jot those ideas down. Maybe you currently have a strong sense of how you practice self-care, or maybe this is a next step for you. Whatever the case may be, it will be critical to schedule time and stick to it. Yes, and one of the ways that you can consider sticking to your plan for self-care is by tracking it. And some good examples of how that can come into practice are physical exercise, reading, meditation, or some of your personal hobbies. As we think about tracking our self-care, here's one tool that we wanted to share with you. This tracker is broken up into four quadrants, mind, heart, soul, and body. And this correlates directly to one of the standards that Kim referenced earlier. And um, that standard states that effective school leaders develop and use data to inform a plan to foster professional growth of self. And pouring into yourself in these categories will ultimately impact your overall well-being, which helps yourself grow professionally and personally. Whatever you decide to do, it is important that you hold yourself accountable, carve out that time, and are intentional about, about caring for yourself. Thanks, Kia. No problem. So we're going to take a moment right now to reflect and think about two of your specific self-care actions. On your participant guide in page, on page three, there's a tool there for you to consider what they look like in our current reality. When will you do these activities? How often will you do them? And how are you going to hold yourself accountable to making sure that you're carving out time to care for yourself regularly? So we're gonna pause here for about a minute and give you a little bit of time to jot down some of those ideas on page three. So we hope that you had an opportunity to get off to a good start. Again, we recognize that you can't finish your plan, but we encourage you to return to this template and fully finish out your plan to care for yourself during this challenging time after our session together today. All right, so let's move on into communication. Again, when we think about the professional standards that we hold ourselves to, we'd like for you to think about this. Effective school leaders employ technology to improve operational efficiency, which includes but is not limited to data and communication systems that monitor and improve school outcomes. And as we think about communication, it can be extremely complex in a school community, but this virtual setting makes that even more challenging. Research proves that shorter communication cycles are more effective in building and sustaining morale and engagement. With that being said, it's important to reset and clarify expectations. In this new virtual environment, leaders must help their team shift to asynchronous work and personalization. Help the team to reset expectations of how to work, how their work gets done. Leaders will have to let go of when and how tasks are accomplished. Allow team members to accomplish their responsibilities according to their work schedules and needs. This does not mean that the leader is always the person responsible for the communication. Regular consistent communication will ensure that all team members are on the same page, which will ultimately decrease stress and the fear of the unknown that can occur when communication is lacking. And to do that well, it will be important to organize short frequent touch points. Research indicates that we should not go more than a half day without checking in in some way with our teams. Think about how you normally meet. Leadership team meetings, PLCs, etc. How can those continue and still fit into the parameters of our virtual school community? Remember, we discussed the need for frequent communication. The purpose is as much for communicating school specific updates, as well as to ensure the well being and sustainability of the entire team. So, whether it's a short check in or a longer team meeting, the school leader can and should delegate the responsibilities for facil facilitating those touch points. So take a moment to reflect on your current communication practices. 
what is going well and what opportunities for improvement exist? And what's been a challenge for you? So we have an example here that we'd like you to um, review. So just take a moment to review this example communication plan and it's also on page four of the participant guide. As you review, we hope some of the things that stand out um, are firstly that there are a variety of communication touch points facilitated by a variety of team members. Additionally, the touch points vary in frequency, purpose, and audience. Having a fully developed plan that is communicated to the staff will help to alleviate stress. This is just one example. You may have other team members that might be part of your plan. For example, your PTO may take part in messaging some forms of communication in your school community. So this is something that you can do now, even if you haven't done this previously. This is a tool that once it's been developed could be pushed out through social media, phone, email, even text as a screenshot. Thank you, Kim. Um, and if you refer to your participant guide at this time, you will see a few other examples. Um, you see one example of a social media post that is very clearly targeted towards students, encouraging them to carve out a space to study. Um, some of the things you notice there is that it uses vibrant colors, that there is minimal text, um, and that is really encouraging and in, in wanting students to participate actively. Um, you also see a sample memo to families that doesn't have any specific updates, but it's framed very positively and the language is encouraging to students and families that the school is going to continue to work hard to serve their students, even during this challenging time. So those are just some examples of how we can use communication to reach the different stakeholders in our school communities. Thanks, Kia. So take a moment to think about your current strategies for communication. What does that look like in our current reality? What are your specific next steps? When will it happen, how often, and with whom will you share the responsibility? And most importantly, what do you need in order to make sure you are effectively and consistently communicating with all of your key stakeholders? Take about a minute on page five in your participant guide to start that plan. So we're gonna move on to our next topic, but thank you for putting time and effort into this extremely important piece of managing a virtual school community. So let's go ahead and let's move into instructional support. So here we've referenced some language from professional standards, which states effective educational leaders strive for equity of educational opportunity and culturally responsive practices to promote each student's academic success and well-being. Additionally, effective educational leaders develop and support intellectually rigorous and coherent systems of curriculum, instruction, and assessment to promote each student's academic success and well being. So, take a moment to review this statement, which is found in most professional standards for effective school leaders. Whether we are in a virtual learning space or a face to face space, school leaders will always have the responsibility of providing instructional support and feedback. This includes observing practice, providing feedback and coaching support, and then providing any resources that will enhance student learning and ensure that there are equitable opportunities for students to engage in meaningful learning experiences. So as we begin to engage in this conversation focused on instructional support, during virtual learning, it is important to remain focused on the learning and keeping our students first. We are not recreating the entire school day. However, we do want to be cognizant of helping to ensure that we provide students with meaningful learning experiences while maintaining their connection to the school community. In order to do this well, it is critical that teachers continue to receive feedback and support on instructional practice. Leaders should plan and schedule purposeful visits to learn how virtual learning works with the goal of utilizing their observations to provide resources and support 
that will benefit both teachers and students. Such visits will provide the school leader with firsthand knowledge of not only instructional success, but also help teachers to reflect on the actionable next steps that will benefit their students. And in order to do this well, Kim, it's going to be important that school leaders are open to this idea of virtual teacher coaching, which is the ongoing process of observation and feedback that will ultimately maximize teacher effectiveness and student achievement outcomes. Absolutely. So let's take a look at this virtual visit data collection tool. You'll find this tool on page six of your participant guide. Take about 30 seconds to just skim down the page and become familiar with the look for us. We'll be back in 30 seconds. So let's begin to take a look and examine the look for us. Kia, would you mind starting us off? Sure, no problem. So the first look for you see there is high leverage practices utilized. And some of the things that you'll want to observe and look for in this category include the number of students actively participating, equitable opportunities for learning, any culturally responsive practices that are used, how the teacher is differentiating learning for diverse learners, and if there's any specific virtual engagement strategies that the teacher is employing to keep students on track and engaged. So I noticed to the right of that, we've got two columns, student actions and behaviors and teacher actions and behaviors. What might be some of the things we'd be capturing there? Right, so in the teacher actions column, you would want to focus um, very heavily on the moves that the teacher is using to invite students into the lesson. So what specific directions is the teacher giving? What prompts is the teacher using to give students an entry point into the lesson? How is the teacher scaffolding questions so that all students can access the content? And what opportunities for engagement, um, you know, whether they are virtual in the chat box um, or, you know, a, a thumbs up, thumbs down on the, in the screen for the teacher to be able to assess whether or not the students are following along and to check for their understanding. On the student end, you're going to want to focus on how the students are actually responding to those teacher moves. So how many students provided a response? What was the quality of those responses? Are there any students that are struggling to access the content um, or that are disengaged and not you know, responding to teacher prompts or following along with the text? Um, those are some of the things you would want to observe in those categories to be able to assess what potential next steps might enhance the teacher's um, instruction delivery. Absolutely. The next look for is learning in a virtual environment. And as we visit multiple virtual classrooms, some of the things that we may want to think about include how is the technology enhancing student learning, but also what's getting in the way of students' academic success, what's getting in the way of their ability to access the content, and even what's getting in the way of their ability to engage with their peers and with the teacher. Uh, additionally, and maybe most importantly, what are the inequities that may have surfaced due to the virtual environment? Kia, can we talk through a little bit of how we might see that in a classroom, a virtual yeah. classroom? I think that's a, a really important point right now. Um, learning in the virtual environment for many of our students is going to be something that is very new. And so there are many barriers that could possibly exist in this setting. Um, just the baseline technological knowledge um, could prevent students from being able to fully engage in a lesson. Um, and it could also, uh, we could find that students don't have access to strong internet connection or even to devices, which is just a barrier for them even getting on and accessing the lesson. So those are some of the ways that inequity could show its face in our virtual classrooms and some of the things that we just have to consider as we figure out how to best support our students and meet their needs. Excellent. Thank you. So the next thing you're going to want to look for is what opportunities for support exist. So as you're considering the strategies and all of the pieces that and elements that exist in learning in the virtual environment, you're going to want to make note of what additional supports could be provided to enhance the delivery of that instruction and what can make the teacher stronger so that they can take a good lesson to a great lesson and that you're reaching as many students as possible. So what could that look like? Yeah, so that could look like in a session where you have half of the students that 
are not actively responding, providing that teacher with some additional training on how to get kids engaged during a virtual lesson. That could also look like um, if a teacher expresses that they have struggled to get students to access a text um, because of the fact that they don't have some of the support that they had in the traditional environment, what ways can you scaffold your questions and what ways can you provide multiple instructional level texts so that students of all reading levels and all ability levels can access the material. So what I hear you saying is really looking through two lenses, right? The traditional instructional lens, but also since we're in a new environment, through that technological lens, if you will. Right, absolutely. Can. So I think that connects us directly to that, that next look for that actionable feedback. So as we conduct these visits, we always wanna think about what teacher practice really positively impacted student learning during that time, but also what actionable next step in teacher practice would enhance student outcomes. And so let's talk just a, a little bit about that and how that may look and play out. So in the actionable feedback piece, I think it's going to be so important for our school leaders to remember that that's the part that's actually really going to transform experiences for students. We have to make sure that we have clear next steps for our teachers and that we are telling them what they can actually do and supporting them with what they need to do in order to better meet the needs of students. And that's going to happen during the post-visit conversation. And so we're gonna talk about that in just a moment, but that is where go, that's where we'll look at the data, any outcomes that may have been assessed during the virtual lesson and talking about what needs to happen next so that students are mastering the content even in the virtual setting. Thank you. And in order to make that assessment, they're going to need to discuss the resources. So um, in the virtual community right now, again, we're learning this environment together. And so we might need to be creative and think about what additional resources we may need access to, to provide teachers with everything that they need to serve students well. So that's what will happen there in that post conversation as well is what additional resources would help ensure that students are receiving equitable and rigorous instruction consistently. I think the one thing I would note there is going back to that idea of looking at technology too, just not the, the instructional piece specifically, but again, because we are in this new virtual environment, how can and what resources do we have that would further enhance student um, learning and understanding? And I think that takes us into that next piece, so trends noted, because hopefully we're visiting multi multiple virtual classrooms. And so as we conduct those multiple visits, we really wanna think about, are there any trends that have been noted in those settings that may be consistent across virtual classrooms? So thinking about that, the technology example that we keep referencing, how many kids can get on? And if we notice that there are several students in, in every virtual classroom that can't, that's a trend. What is it that we can do to mitigate that? Would you add anything? No, Kim, I think that's extremely important. And I think that does take us to the next look for, which are the next steps. So the purpose of these virtual classroom visits and observations is twofold. One, to be able to give teachers the wraparound support that they need to deliver the highest quality instructions to students. But as an instructional leader and school leader, you also wanna walk away from these observations with enough information to gauge what needs to happen across your school community to positively impact and move teaching and learning as a whole. So Kia, we've talked about the virtual visit and how this may look a little different. What would you say about the time? That's a really good point, Kim. So in the virtual setting, students are not engaging in direct instruction with the teacher you know, face to face for as long as they would in the traditional setting. And so we should also adjust our observations and our classroom visits to, to meet that new need as well. So observations should typically be anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. Um, because instruction right now, direct instruction for many students is somewhere between 20 and 40 minutes at the most, um, given the virtual setting. So as I'm conducting these virtual visits, in, in light of what you've just said, that they, they may be shorter, would I necessarily be focusing on each of these look fors for um, every visit? No, so you would want to, I think, as a school leader, um, be very clear about what the needs of the particular teacher that you are observing and also just the overall needs and um, instructional priorities in your building and tailor what you're looking for 
to those needs. So you may just choose one thing to observe for when you're in a virtual environment or during that um, pre-conference visit, which we'll discuss in just a moment, the teacher may identify something specifically in terms of their own personal areas of development that they'd like for you to focus on during the lesson. So you would definitely want to consider your building needs and priorities, the teacher's needs and priorities, and tailor your visit to those needs. Thank you. So I mentioned preparing for the virtual visit and that pre-conference conversation. And so you're really going to want to make sure that you define a very clear purpose and that you are clear about what the overall needs are of the building and that the teacher has an opportunity to communicate with you about what their needs are as well. Um, so in that pre-conference, you're just gonna wanna figure out what you need to know going into the conversation. And then you're gonna follow a post-visit coaching conversation where you can discuss how the teacher supported student learning and growth and what are some specific next steps that the teacher could employ to just move that forward. And then the follow-up. So after the observation has taken place and the next steps have been identified, you should always follow up with that teacher to make sure that they have access to the resources and support that they need to continue to further that instruction. So we're actually going to, um, Kim and I are going to model an example of this process for you um, on the next few slides in our presentation. So for the purpose of our virtual visit scenario, I'm going to be Miss Apple, a seventh grade English teacher that is working in a building where the priorities include supporting the early implementation of virtual learning, improving teacher practice, and supporting student learning. All right, Miss Apple. So how are you doing today, Miss Apple? I'm doing well. Thank you so much, Miss Day. Well, thanks for being here with me. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes to um, have a short conversation in preparation, in preparation for this virtual visit. Um, so I'd like to start just by asking you to tell me a little bit about the class that we're gonna be visiting. Um, is there anything specific I need to know? Yes, so the class that you'll be observing is my seventh grade English language arts class. I do have 25 students enrolled in that class. We're only in the second week of virtual meeting together, so um, attendance has been a little bit inconsistent. So that's a challenge that I'm working through. The class was working on a novel unit prior to the school closure. And so we are continuing with that novel unit and the skill that we'll be working on during the lesson is making inferences. So we'll be reading a specific excerpt from the novel together and students will be expected to be able to make an inference and then justify the inference that they've made by citing specific evidence and events from the text. Um, in regards to the just makeup of my class, I love those babies. I have three students that are English language learners in that class, and I also have two students that have individualized education plans in that class as well. So I heard you reference that the expectation would be for students to be able to make an inference. Is there anything else you would add in terms of expectations for student success or mastery by the end of the, the lesson? So one piece that's important to note is that the ultimate, ultimate excuse me, assessment of whether or not they've mastered the objective is actually going to happen outside of our meeting time together. So we are doing some modeling together. They'll have an opportunity to do a short inference exercise with me um, in the Google Doc that I'm providing to them during the lesson. And then they'll do uh, another longer assignment outside of the lesson that they'll submit to me um, two days after our meetings because we meet every other day at this point. All right. So thinking about that, um, what technology um, will be utilized to support instruction and student learning during this particular lesson? So um, that's an easy question nowadays because yeah. all of us are uh, you know, meeting virtually on the computer. But in addition to that, I am using the chat function in the platform to um, have students respond both to me and to their peers throughout the lesson. I'm also using the reaction function so students can give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. So at different points in the lesson, I am going to pause and just check for understanding in that way. And then I also am using the thought catcher, which is a Google document that I can actually see them and put their thoughts. Um, if they have any questions, there's a, a virtual parking lot on there that they can um, go through as we're reading. And then finally, I am doing a model um, and think aloud, and I'll be annotating um, on the screen for them as I'm going through the think aloud so that I'm hopefully trying to meet both the audio and the visual aspect of, of learner needs during the lesson. 
Wow. So as you as you describe that, do you anticipate any um, challenges for for the students, either in terms of the actual instruction um, or the technology? I do. So as I mentioned, um, attendance has been a little bit spotty. And I think in that same vein, it's been challenging to just ensure that students are remaining on task and fully engaged during the lesson um, in the classroom. You know, I know who my babies are that may tend to get off task and I can use proximity and I can be right there to evaluate their work quality and product to make sure that they're staying on task, but that's much harder in this setting. So um, that would be something that if you could look for that when you are observing, um, I would really appreciate that because I'm just trying to figure out more ways to make sure that the students are actively engaged from start to finish, especially since we have less time together now than we did before. I absolutely will pay attention to that specifically. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm excited to, to visit. Let's go. So unfortunately, for the purposes of our scenario, you will not be able to watch my marvelous virtual lesson, but we do have some um, really thorough evidence that we collected here on the data collection tool. So we're going to give you about three minutes to review the evidence that we've collected, and then together we'll talk and work through the additional components on the tool to make some assessments of what the teacher may need to do next uh, to better support students. And you'll find this particular document on page seven in your participant guide. So we're gonna come back together. And Kim, if we could just talk um, through some of the evidence that was collected and then move into assessing what some of the best next steps may be for this particular scenario. Excellent, so let's kind of start with that first look for high leverage strategies utilized and just thinking about what was noted during the lesson for teacher actions and behaviors. So one of the things the teacher began with was the hook uh, reviewing the skill um, using a popular music figure um, to engage students' interests, giving them some time to really think about that and reflect on that. Mm -hmm. um, the teacher narrated that thing time clearly. Um, one of the things that really stood out was the expectation of a 100% res um, response. And the teacher said specifically, I have four teammates that have not submitted a response. Let me know if you need help using the chat function. Uh, the teacher additionally provided an electronic note catcher so that um, she could monitor student responses. What did you notice in terms of the teacher actions? Um, I've noticed those things and I also think that the teacher, um, you know, was extremely excited about the lesson, which I think is really important to do and that that was noted by using that high interest um, and relevant material that would get the kids interested. And by saying I have four teammates that have not yet submitted a response and didn't assume the best that students were just checked out and you know, or not following the directive that they may actually be experiencing challenges. And so I think that's so important to remember and to think about um, because had she you know, just assumed that the students were actively choosing to not participate, that could have changed the tone for them and not had them as engaged or excited to engage in that lesson. So I, I think that that was a really great way to go about that. Um, and then the, the virtual poll. So I think that that is a great strategy, particularly in this setting, to be able to see what students are thinking and just to see a very quick distribution of where students are in terms of their thinking and understanding. Yeah, speaking of the student distribution, you know, of the 18 students that were present in that lesson that day, 14 originally submitted responses and then 
the teacher made the comment about the 100% expectation. So two additional responses were added. Um, the think aloud was very beneficial for students in helping them understand the expectations for making the inferences. What else did you notice with regard to students? Um, I think to that point around the number of students that participated, there were still two students um, that ultimately did not participate in submitting a response and um, there was no clear indication as to why. So that would be something that we would con continue to consider and think about. Um, and the other piece is that the teacher did note that there were 25 students enrolled in the class um, and there are 18 participating in the session. So just thinking about again, um, when we move into trends, what does it look like for, you know, to, to move toward more 100% participation in the overall classroom session? And that may also be an opportunity for support if for some reason she has not been able to, to reach those students. Uh, let's take a look at the next look for, the learning in the virtual environment. What were your thoughts in terms of the evidence we were able to collect? Um, I think it is extremely challenging to keep students engaged and meet the needs of diverse learners. Um, in the traditional classroom. So the fact that the teacher used both the think aloud and then the visual annotation on the screen to try to meet the needs of all of her students was definitely commendable. Um, and it did provide the students with, again, a number of ways to think about the skill. Um, I do think that there were some um, lengthy times during the read aloud. So that might be something that we consider as we continue to talk through the tool. But um, that was just one thing that I noted is that it's, it's a longer um, amount of time to read when you're virtual and not right there with the students. Absolutely. And just sort of going back to the number of students actually enrolled and the number that were in the class that day and the number that actually participated, just one of those barriers for kids in terms of the technology may have been the inability to either use the chat function or some other um, technological issue. So it's just something to think about in terms of opportunities for support. So yeah. let's talk about that uh, talk about that a little bit. Um, you want to start us off? Yeah, I think um, one thing that's going to be critical all the time in this new setting now is just making sure that all students have access to the technology, um, you know, making sure that they have access to internet, that they have access to a device. And then also, if there's any specific tools within the platforms that you are using to deliver instruction that the kids actually need to know how to do, that you're taking some time to review those things as well. Because as adults, we sit in these virtual sessions and sometimes can't find where we need to use the chat box or don't know how to use the reaction function. So really being explicit about um, making sure that kids just know how to use those things if they're going to be embedded into the lesson regularly. Absolutely, and that sort of bleeds into that next piece about that actionable feedback. And so when we think about the things that made the biggest difference or had the biggest impact on student learning in the session, that explicit modeling that you talked about, which is always important, but maybe even more so in a situation where you're not face-to-face -face with students. Um, she did check for understanding uh, on occasion, so that was important. The using the chat function and just communicating that expectation for 100% participation, setting the tone. Yeah, and I think that those were really great steps. Um, I think in regards to um, how to take it from good to great, one, the teacher did message in the pre-conference that she was a little bit concerned about the students who had some additional needs like the English language learners and the students with IEPs and that they wouldn't have the push and support that they typically have. So um, I think to try to better meet the needs of those students, and making sure that all students are staying on task, since that was also a concern. Pausing more frequently and providing more time for students to process and to engage in that thought catcher and to do their own annotations would have, um, I think, you know, started to, to allow the teacher to work toward improving the outcomes there. Um, because I do think that part of the not getting to 100% response may have been some of those challenges that she anticipated, either students dis dis disengaging or um, just needing a little bit more time to fully process the text and to make their inference. Absolutely. And that leads us right down to the resources, right? And um, you mentioned the support for being able to differentiate for students and, and that like, leads to the idea of scaffolding. Anything else that you would add in terms of resources that may be needed by the teacher? 
So I think one important resource that could possibly also be identified as a trend for the school because of the fact that um, literacy is uh, important in every content area is just thinking about what virtual strategies for literacy instruction there are. Um, again, you have a classroom with mixed needs and mixed skill levels. It's really, there's a lot of resources out there that allow us to take one text and tailor it to multiple reading levels um, and interactive ways to allow students to process their thinking as they're reading through a document together. So I think gathering some of those specific resources and sharing them with this particular teacher and potentially the school community based on needs would be um, a really valuable resource. Thank you. In terms of the trends, we've talked quite a bit about the number of students that were um, present in the lesson versus how many participated and then really in terms of how many were actually enrolled in the course. So thinking about trends, if that's the situation, if we are um, in a class of 26 students and 18 are present, then what's happening to that other group of students? And if that's the same in, across the board in the classrooms, that might be something that we need to pay particular attention to. Absolutely, because I think, you know, if we are, we have eight students in every class that are not able to log into our classroom instruction and to benefit from, you know, the hard work that our teachers are putting in, then that's a big number when you look at our entire school building. And so I think that it's extremely important to think about how we can address those needs and eliminate any barriers that may exist for students being able to participate in the virtual, virtual learning environment. And that takes us down to that last piece about next steps. What are your thoughts about next steps? So I think that it would be, again, important to reach out to the students that are not participating and being able to, to determine what the barriers are, whether it's a time constraint, um, or if there are other challenges that are impeding their ability to participate in the virtual environment. Thank you. No problem, Kim. So as we think about providing instructional support, it's so important to think about what this looks like in our current reality because it is different and it is challenging, but it is crucial for our students. On page eight in your participant guide, there's a template that you can use to start to flesh out your plan and it can you can identify your specific next steps how you will communicate the purpose and the process to your staff, how are you going to monitor professional responsibilities, and what do you need in order to make sure that you are providing rigorous and robust instructional support to your teachers? We'll pause here for just a minute. So we're going to come back together and move on to our final topic for our session today. But instructional support is one of the most important aspects of being a virtual school community leader. And we want you to come back to this template and to finish developing that plan. All right. So as Kia mentioned, we're moving on to our last topic for today, sustaining morale and social emotional support. And once again, as we think about the language from professional standards that we hold ourselves accountable to, we want to think about how effective educational leaders develop the professional capacity and practice of school personnel to promote each student's academic success and well being. Thank you, Kim. So, focusing on sustaining morale and social emotional support is a critical component in every aspect of managing the virtual school community. Humans are hypersocial creatures that long to belong, and connection will assist in maintaining the well being of both students and staff. The way that looks for individuals is unique, and we need to be prepared to meet the needs 
and meet people where they are. School leaders will be intentional in finding ways to bring staff together, whether it's whole group, small group, and one-on-one -on -one, to ensure that that need for human connection is being met. I think it's important to point out that this is not a solo responsibility and it's important to leverage the strengths of your team by taking turns and assigning tasks based on individual strengths. As a team, think about how you will support the social emotional needs of your staff. One important factor will be to think about authenticity. The intent here is not to cause undue stress. Therefore, delegation and remaining true to leadership style is going to be critical. Absolutely, Kim. And the facilitation of virtual team building opportunities is a fun and unique way to maintain connection among your key stakeholders. So we're going to take a look at a few examples. Um, we have some fun pictures of teams that are finding ways to be creative and integrate joy into their virtual school communities. So to the left, we have an example of a virtual spirit week with suggestions for daily fun themes. On the top right is a screenshot of a team actively participating in Spirit Week and showcasing costumes of their favorite characters and their favorite books during a virtual staff meeting. And below that, we have a teacher who really went all out and is wearing her Wonder Woman pajamas during a virtual lesson. The one thing that I would like for you to take away from these examples is one that, again, they are keeping the joy in our work um, and providing that ability to connect that is so very much needed right now. But they are also um, initiatives that don't require a huge lift. In each of these cases, teams of teachers came together to organize the themes, sent them out to the school community, and everyone jumped in to participate. So this is not intended at all to monopolize any of your very limited time. Thank you, Kia. So let's go ahead and take a moment to think about your current strategies for sustaining morale and social emotional support. And on page nine of your participant guide, please think about the following. What do they look like in our current reality? What are your specific next steps? When, how often, and how will you share the responsibility? And as Key has been saying in the other um, topic areas, specifically, what do you need to make this happen? Let's take a minute or two to reflect and jot those ideas down. So once again, we realize and recognize that that's not enough time to develop a complete plan, but we encourage you that after our time together today that you revisit this and take some action on the steps you've identified. So as you think about your next steps, we are going to take a moment to prioritize. We've talked through self-care, communication, instructional support, and building and sustaining morale and social emotional support. Where are things going really well already in your school community? And what feels the most urgent and immediate? On page 10 in your participant guide, there's a template where you can identify what emerges as an urgent need for you, and also the resources that you will need to begin to enact the action plans that you've started creating today. Take about a minute to get those plans started. So we're gonna come back together and wrap up our time together today. We know that's not enough time, but prioritization is so important and we hope that you got a good start. So we'd like to encourage all of our participants to engage in an idea exchange with us by quickly uploading a video clip of one of your action steps for the purpose of sharing ideas and building and strengthening our network improvement community. You have um, the option of as you, 
upload the video, you can do that by turning on the camera function on your phone and holding it up to the QR code and that will allow you to upload your uh, very short video clip directly to our folder. So please take some time to do that. Thank you. Additionally, uh, we've listed the resources that were utilized today to uh, develop the content. Please take some time to examine those. All of the resources are linked directly to the actual resource. And here is the QR code again. You can just go to the camera setting on your phone, scan the code, and you will get access to all of the resources from today's session. So we'd just like to thank you for your participation today and for all of the hard work that you are doing to support students and teachers during this global crisis. Additionally, we appreciate your feedback and ask that you complete a brief survey so that we can continue to support school leaders as you work to support your school communities during this challenging time. In an effort to continue that support, we'd like to introduce you to a tool called Advanced Feedback. Please take a few minutes to view the video following With advanced feedback, we're able to provide reflection time for teachers. We'll provide our administrators an opportunity to watch um, teachers teach and then determine what professional development they need to attend. Here's what we know about traditional sit and get professional development. It simply doesn't work. And no matter how hard we try, we never are able to give teachers the amount of support they need when they need it. We lose teachers in education often in the first two to three years because they feel unsupported and they don't feel competent in the role. Um, to provide a video tool that allows a teacher to self-check, self-audit, and, and improve um, is going to help those teachers feel more confident more quickly and it's going to keep good teachers in the classroom. With advanced feedback, our teachers for the first time are able to self-reflect. They're able to watch their practice and improve. Teachers look at how they've taught, what worked, what didn't work, and then we use best practices to make that better. It's so much easier when you're seeing it and you can actually use what you're seeing to make the change to make it better instructional practice. Recently, Inside Advance launched Advance Live, and what happened was our users who have been coming back to us over the years have said the asynchronous version of coaching with video works really well, but there are opportunities where they can do so much more with synchronous as well. Even behind the technology, we can connect with a real person, provide a real face, have a face-to-face -face conversation even if we're not sitting in the same school. It's perfect for creating one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions that just need to be, happen very quickly, that might be a follow-up to a previous observation. But what's also great is we can have meetings with up to 10 folks who are in PLCs and do all kinds of training with that. In my role as superintendent and in the role of principals, um, sometimes scheduling is such um, a, a key factor in whether or not you can provide the adequate support. Well, when you're using video, that takes that, that barrier away. It gives flexibility because as administrators, you can't be everywhere. Sometimes your, your needs are greater than your personnel, and so it just opens that door that even if you can't physically be in that classroom, you can still have an opportunity to provide that feedback on that lesson. Coaches are in love with the fact that coaching looks different when they use advanced feedback. They love the idea that they can watch video, timestamp video, share videos with each other. Outside of the coaching cycle, a teacher can look at another teacher's best practice and actually apply that to their classroom. One of the great things about using Inside Advance is advanced feedback is that it allows those coaching cycles to take place more frequently and it helps save time for both the teacher and the coaches involved. So the, the video features and advanced feedback is helping coaches provide more formative feedback along the way with much greater frequency and we know that's pushing practice more effectively because that's what the research says, that frequency matters, the touch points matter, and so the technology is allowing them to do this with greater frequency and really engage teachers on a really ongoing basis.